We're still hanging around these broad top. Just got done riding the M3. And while the current end of the track is four miles north near Shirleysburg, the line extends several more miles to Mount Union. I decided to keep following the track as much as I could and see what ruins I could locate. Before we head out of Rock Hill, however, there's a historic marker that caught my eye. There's some military history along the EVT, as the family of Admiral William Sims lived in this house at the end of the 19th century. Sims brought to the attention of President Theodore Roosevelt improvements needed in the U.S. Navy. Improvements that helped make the U.S. Navy the most powerful in the world. Now, following the northern right-of-way is not too difficult, except when yours truly is driving. So, I made a boo-boo and neglected to turn off Route 522 onto Pump Station Road. So, I missed photographing one of the railroad's largest landmarks. This is the Lower Agwick Bridge. The railroad always has had a bridge of some kind here since 1873, but accidents and washouts necessitated a completely new structure in 1914. Several designs were proposed out of steel girders. The railroad's engineer, F.M. Butler, proposed a modified plan. This called for the use of curved 40-pound rail the railroad had laying around a surplus to create four arches, each 43 feet 6 inches wide, all encased with concrete. An experimental concept, at least for the EBT. The bridge was completed in 1915. Similar designs would be used by Butler on other bridges. Although suffering damage from Hurricane Fran in 1996, the span remained standing. The right-of-way comes back alongside 522 in the village of Allenport. It has only ever been a community of a few hundred, with a business park developing in recent years. Although on passion or timetables of the period, no station is known to have stood here. A train hasn't crossed these tracks in over 50 years, and, well, it shows. It's interesting to note, however, that accommodations have been made for the right-of-way as it crosses over 522, just south of Mount Union. Mount Union marks the northern terminus of the line, with one of the larger yards for the railroad located here. This was, in fact, the first yard established for the EBT, as construction for the railroad began here all the way back in 1872, peeling off the Pennsylvania Railroad's main line. It's in Mount Union the uniqueness of this line becomes obvious with the specialized rail laid down. As stated in our previous videos in the series, the EBT is narrow gauge, only three feet wide. The larger railroad companies such as the Pennsylvania Railroad and today's Norfolk Southern operate with standard gauge, four foot wide track. In order to be profitable, the EBT had to overcome this hurdle. Their yard was made dual gauge with free tracks to allow rolling stock of both gauges to move freely. Of course, the issue still remained, how is going to cargo going to be transferred? Initially, a long wooden tipple was used to dump coal and ore from the narrow gauge hoppers into standard ones below. Around 1915, a transfer dock was constructed to make physical movement of additional goods from the two gauges easier. This process was tedious to say the least. Somebody wondered if it would be easier to just change the gauges of the cars. This would require the trucks underneath every car to be swapped out. Fortunately, at Mount Union, the EBT had a massive crane that could lift the weight of rail cars. It was initially built in 1924, the transferred timber being brought up from Rock Hill, but in 1933, the timber transfer began to be regularly used for the purpose of lifting rail cars off its trucks. Now, the process wasn't perfect. A specialized coupler was needed to connect the wider rolling stock with the narrower locomotives. But this transfer process streamlined the manner in which the EBT would operate for the last decades of the common carrier age. The Mount Union Yard was not exclusive to gauge transfers. In 1925, an upgraded coal cleaning plant was established to replace the one in Robertsdale. They carried over the chance process that used water and sand to float anthracite coal from Boney and applied it for the first time to bituminous coal. When talking with Mr. Pearson at Robertsdale, he informed me that there was a chemistry facility within this plant to meticulously augment particular orders of coal to meet the need of the customers. Some of those customers were across the country, but others were literally across the street. More on that in a few. The yard was heavily active for the entire history of the East Broadtop, but much like the yard in Robertsdale, the Mount Union Yard fell silent in 1956. One of the last actions was bringing the last coal train in for delivery, and hoppers from that train remain standing in the yard to this day. 
While rails remain rusting, much noise has been made in the ownership of the yard. A number of years ago, and I'm talking about the late 90s, the Mount Union Connecting Railroad was incorporated. Their mission was to put the line from Mount Union to Allenport back into commercial service to shuffle freight from the industrial parks that had been built along this stretch. They cleared brush and trees grown in the yard, laid new track, even brought a Plymouth engine from Rock Hill for motive power. But by the mid-2000s, the project came to a halt. If I had to theorize, the businesses they had hoped to service either found alternatives to rail or it closed up entirely. In the 2010s, an entity known as the East Broadtop Preservation Association had ownership of the property. From what I've gathered through discussion boards, their plan was to create a commercially viable railroad that would buy the EBT from the Kowalczyks from north to south as profits allowed. But with the EBT Foundation buying the Kowalczyks' ownership over the line, the Preservation Association has sat in limbo. As you've saw spliced through that mouthful, the yard is becoming overgrown once more. Most of the structures were scrapped in the 1970s, yet a large amount of hoppers remain. In recent years, the establishment of a shopping plaza has destroyed much of the coal trestle. You also find a long fill bordering the south side of the yard made up of a mixture of bony and bricks. Amongst those bricks, you'll find names local to Mount Union stamped upon them. That's because in addition to being home of the East Broadtop's northern terminus, Mount Union was once home to the largest silica-producing brickyard in the country. Let's head a little bit up the line to one of the last surviving structures of the brick industry. This warehouse is now home to the Bricktown Museum. The museum actually has two purposes, one to preserve the history of Mount Union, and the other to be home of the Bricktown Model Railroad Association. Their mission is to build a scale model of the East Broadtop, complete with scratch-built models of historic structures that once stood along the right-of-way. Now, during my visit, it wasn't much to look at as the models were sent up to Juniata College for a special display to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the line. But seeing photos of these models juxtaposed to the space that the group have to work with makes me excited to see what the final product will look like. The museum is in the midst of building up a collection of relics relating to the free refractories that established Mount Union. The warehouse now serving as the museum was part of the Harbinson Walker Refractory, which had a tramway heading into the mountain to access Gannister Rock. They were supplied coal from Robertsdale by the EBT to fire their kilns. Harbinson Walker had the distinction of being the first refractory that was built to exclusively produce silica brick in the United States. The East Broadtop would move the Gannister and clay to the other two refractories, as well as providing them with coal. Today, little survives of either free refractories. The switching from coal to natural gas by Harbinson Walker was a death knell to the common carrier days of the East Broadtop. Harbinson Walker themselves would close in 1985. Amongst other infrastructure entirely demolished includes the East Broadtop's Mount Union Station. Although no longer standing, it's very easy to line up where it once stood. A lot of great photos were taken here over the years. There's presently a cool old brick building that apparently was once known as the Kenmore Hotel. In fact, there are a lot of cool old brick buildings still standing in Mount Union. Of course, one wouldn't expect anything less from a place nicknamed Bricktown. Before night settles over the valley, I shuffled over to nearby Huntington, Pennsylvania to get a few shots of a bridge that predates the East Broadtop. The Stone Arch Bridge was constructed between 1848 and 1850 to carry the original main line of the Pennsylvania Railroad across Standing Creek. The main lines has since been realigned a few feet onto an equally impressive Stone Arch Bridge. The local Rotary Club currently tends to the preservation of this piece of transportation history. That, ladies and gentlemen, will conclude Volume 2 of Retracing the East Broadtop Railroad. We got to see the northern and southern terminus, as well as ride in a one-of-a-kind piece of maintenance-of-way equipment. Of course, we still haven't seen all of the East Broadtop. Readout Productions will return sometime in the future. But for now, there is plenty more chapters of our shared past to explore. If you stayed through the end, be sure to hit the like button before you leave. If you want to follow me as I retrace history, including the East Broadtop, consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to go the extra mile in supporting historical outings like this one, you can buy me a cup of coffee for the Kofi link in the description below. Thank you all, and we'll see you in the next video.